Uh, okay, so we are, uh, by my according, we have two more sessions in Christian Worldview. Two more after today. This is the next to last, what we call the fruits of worldviews. We've described worldviews as trees. We've said that there are three major worldviews in the world. We're talking about overarching worldviews. Somebody remind us what they are. Naturalism, transcendentalism, Christianity. Those are the three, you know, broad, large trees, large worldviews that really shape the majority of life on this planet. And then you can start to plug in all sorts of things, what we would call fruits of those trees under, under, those, under those umbrellas. Um, do me a favor, Jabez, and just go slip out into the hallway and tell those children they need to go to class. Do that for me, would you? Giving you full authority. Be kind. Be kind when you do it. Don't abuse your power. This is a real opportunity for you to express your Christian worldview. Let's see how he does. Let's just pause for a moment and see how he does. Oh, he's engaged. The laughter has ceased. No one's crying. <laughs> and now they're leaving. I'm going to say job well done. It's a real opportunity, Jabez, and you did it. Thank you very much. Um, so we are uh, talking about worldview, and today we're talking about history. This is the last major uh, uh, fruit of a worldview. Can somebody quickly say just some of them? This is the this is the tenth. We're actually going to do an eleventh one. Can somebody remember some of the others? History. It's hard if you if you have to think about it. Biology was one. Government. Culture. Church, we talked about the spheres of authority. What else? Yeah, all types. Theology, philosophy, ethics, biology, psychology, sociology, law, government, economics. And we talked about everything that y'all mentioned at some point. Okay, so we're wrapping up today with history. What is the meaning of the past? Um, can somebody read 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Verses 14 and 15 for us. Ian, nice and loud. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. But He did not raise Him if, in fact, the dead are nor raised. Good. Thank you, Ian. So, <clears throat> the central event in terms of history for the Christian worldview is what? What is the central event for Christians? Not just the birth. All of it, right? So we might say, sister, we might say the birth, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and we would even say the ascension. So the entire life and some, sometimes for shorthand, we'll just say the death of Jesus Christ or the crucifixion, we will sometimes say. But really we're talking about his entire human life. Christians really do believe and have for 2,000 years and even going back through prophecy even before that. One of my favorite verses of prophecy is in Hebrews 11, which talks about Moses, right? We spent three years in Deuteronomy. One of my favorite verses of Scripture in Hebrews is talking about Moses in his time of being in the book of Deuteronomy. And so for Christians, and we would go all the way back to Adam to build that Christian case. Think about it in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, where does Christ appear? The prophecy that God the Father tells Adam and Eve and Satan what is the curse that God the Father tells Satan the seed of woman that's the personal sin that's the personal curse but then he goes on to say what what's the prophecy about Christ 
Seed of the seed of man, you will bruise his heel. He will crush your head. Right? That's about Christ. First pages of the Bible. Right? So what's the what's the historical main event for Christians? It is Christ's life. Okay, we don't make any bones about that. We go back from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We say this entire book is about Christ. We, I've, you've heard me say this many times. Uh, it's not new to me. God is the hero of this book. And I would even say He is the only hero of this book. Okay, so let's talk about naturalism and transcendentalism first. And then we're going to end up there again. What's naturalism's view of history? I want you to think about this for just a sec second. If you truly believe there is no God and there is no supernatural existence and life is only what you can see, touch, taste, smell, and, and feel and, and you are born and you live and then you die and you're no more, then what is the, what is the purpose of history? What is the view of history to the naturalist? What is the value of it and what is the meaning of it? Of history. What would you say? Give me some guesses if you don't know. To learn from mistakes? To learn from mistakes? How would you learn... I, I'm with you, sister. That, that seems really reasonable. How would you learn from mistakes if there's no purpose or meaning to the person who made the mistakes. In other words, if we're going to read about Julius Caesar and we understand that Julius Caesar came to a bad end, are we supposed to learn just not to do the things Julius Caesar did? But I'm never going to live Julius Caesar's life. I'm only living my life. That's a good, that's a good answer. Is there anything else? Is a naturalist concerned with what is right and what is wrong in history? What is moral, what is good, and what is evil? Why do you say no, Caleb? I mean, They're not going to believe in an objective moral good or evil. Good. So even like looking at Julius Caesar as an example, the only thing that a naturalist would do is to say, if it works, do it. And if it doesn't work, don't do it. Very pragmatic, right? Pragmatism, not idealism. What should I do with my life? What will make me the most money? What will give me the most success? What will give me the greatest possibility of a mate? Those are the things I should do. What if that's not the best plan for your life? There is no plan for my life. I recently heard a naturalist say this. I was watching a podcast and he literally said, there is no line, there is no path, there is no purpose to life. As you look at your future, it's just dots. Only once you've lived it, you can look back and see that there was a line. What he was saying was, we create our own meaning. There is no meaning. And he's right from a naturalist point of view. From a naturalist worldview, there is no meaning to a personal life. Therefore, there is no meaning to history. So if you, if you read history or watch history or view history, what type of value are you supposed to make from it? Because those were all just random events happening in random lives. There's no story. There's no narrative for the naturalist. So um, you need to know that. You need to understand that the naturalist view of history is, so what? So what? 60 million people died in the Black Plague in 16, you know, 1411 or you know, this many millions of people died in the 20th. You know how many millions of people died in the 20th century? Hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. Naturalists would say, so what? 
There was no purpose to that, no meaning in that, no value in that. So the naturalist view of history is there's no meaning in a human life, therefore there's no meaning to history, because history is just many human lives. Any patterns, purposes, bigger picture are entirely in the imaginations of man. History has no purpose. What's the greatest event in human history to a naturalist? What's the greatest event in human history to a naturalist? Big Bang? It's a good guess. What's the greatest event in human history to a naturalist? It's a trick question, I'll tell you. There isn't one. Not a single one. Not anyone. Because why would there be? It's always, <clears throat> this is as good a place to say this as anywhere. I've always hated the cowardice of naturalists. I've always hated the cowardice of naturalists. I can't tell you how many movies I've seen, how many television shows I've watched, how many books I've read, how many interviews I've seen where uh, a naturalist, and let, let's say that they're a parent, let's say that they're in their 30s or 40s or 50s and they're a parent, and somewhere in that story, movie, television, show, interview, someone will say, what are you, you know, what's your belief about life and death? And I, oh, there's, you know, there, there's no afterlife, there's no purpose, there's no meaning, we're just here and then we die. And the, the other person will go, hmm. And then the next question is always, what do you tell your child? I've seen so many scenes in movies where a child will look up at a father. Father's an atheist, naturalist, and the child looks up, mother's dead. Mother's always dead in these. And the child looks up and goes, Daddy, where, where's Mommy? And the dad always, in these stories, whether it's an interview, whether it's a movie, whether it's a, they always cop out. They always chicken out. They always take the L. They always say something like, well, well, little Maggie, I like to think. That's usually how they start it. I like to think that your mama is somewhere better. They don't believe any of that. But they will lie to a child because they are weak and they are cowards. So I've always hated that about naturalists. I've always hated that. I would have so much more respect for them in that moment if they would, this 45-year-old man would just look his 8-year-old child in the face and go, well, Maggie, she's dead and she's never coming back. She's no more. I would have so much more respect for that. But they all chicken out. Naturalists don't believe there's any point to life, but they keep making up excuses to live life. They lie. They create. They act like God, even as they deny God. It's pretty crazy. Questions, uh, questions or comments about the naturalist view of history. There's no point to it. What, can, what lessons can be learned? Kill better? Produce more? Win all? That's about it. Survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest, that's a phrase y'all are so comfortable with that I have to say it in new ways. Kill everybody. I'm just going to start saying it that way. Kill everybody. Just kill everybody. And if killing everybody doesn't work, sell something to everybody. There's no point to a naturalist view of history, because there's no point to a naturalist view of life. What about the transcendentalist? Surely this one's better. Surely the transcendentalist has figured out history. What's the transcendentalist view of history? Take a guess.
We've said this before many times in many different ways. Transcendentalism is a lot like... Caleb, do you, do you believe that or are you just agreeing with me? Mm. Mm. Okay, so, so transcendental is very concerned with the individual, okay? Also, what happens to your story in transcendentalism? You understand the major religions, the major transcendentalist religions, the, the big two, Buddhism and Hinduism, both of them have space, hold space for reincarnation. You understand that? Both of them hold space for getting do-overs after do-overs after do-overs. So how many human lives are we talking about? What human history are we talking about? This is always funny to me. I saw this again yesterday. I was Again, I was watching another podcast, and this guy was going on and on about his past life. It never fails that when somebody talks about their past lives, they were always a king, a princess, or a general. Nobody was ever a pauper. Nobody washed windows. Nobody was ever a slave. Everybody was always royalty. Give me a break. Give me a break. You only remember your past lives when you were a princess? Come on. How about the ones where you were born as an insect and were immediately gobbled up by a bird? Do you remember that one? No one ever remembers those. I was a minnow, immediately got swallowed by a bigger fish. Then I came back as an insect, immediately got gobbled up by a bird. Came back as an armadillo, got ran over immediately by a car in eastern Texas. Then I lived six generations of a poor man. I hated every minute of it. No one tells those stories. What's the transcendentalist view of history? Ultimately, ultimately, it means nothing. Remember, here's transcendentalism in a nutshell. We came from nothing. You live and 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 you die 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 and you live and you die. I'm already tired. And this person's still got a whole lot of living and dying to do. Living and dying and 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 slowly, gradually over 48,000 lifetimes figuring it out. Then what? What's the ultimate goal? Nirvana. Which literally means to take a candle. And blow out the light. Literally to cease to exist. The goal of transcendentalism is to cease to exist. That sounds a lot like naturalism to me. I mean, whether you're living one life, you are nothing, you live a life and you're nothing, that's naturalism. Or whether you're nothing, you live 10,000 lives and then you're nothing. That seems real similar to me. Frankly, I'm choosing naturalism over transcendentalism. That's just me. I'd just as soon not be eaten by a crow. So in transcendentalism, an individual life means nothing. We all come from nothing. And after many, many, many individual life cycles... We all ultimately return to nothing. What's, <clears throat> what's the greatest event in human history to a transcendentalist? What's the greatest moment in human history for a transcendentalist? Take a guess. Yeah, leading to... Leading to... Sorry? Say it, Caleb. Not, not, yeah. The greatest event in human history is to cease to be human. The greatest event in human history is to cease being human. There's two main analogies you need to remember for transcendentalism. One is the blowing out of a candle. The other is a drop returning to the ocean. In both instances, these are not my... By the way, these are not my analogies. These are their analogies. 
Right? When I talk about Christianity, that's from inside Christianity. When I'm talking about transcendentalism, obviously I'm not a Hindu or a Buddhist, but these are their analogies, not mine. They describe nirvana as the blowing out of a candle, the extinguishing of a candle. They describe returning to the all soul, the Atman, as one drop returning to the ocean, therefore ceasing to exist. They describe it this way, not me. The goal, the greatest thing that could ever happen to humans in human history is to just not be human. That's history. So what is Christianity's view of history? Well, I got to tell you, it makes the most sense to me. It's the most appealing to me. Again, here's the problem. Young people especially, I want you to hear me. I know many of you th that were raised in church and now you're, you're going out into the world and you're, you're seeing, you're seeing all, the, you know, all the things that the world can offer you, either through your phone, through college, through your friends, through all the, all the inputs that, that, that come your way. I get it. And I want you to live life too. And I want you to, you'll figure some of this out on your own. The Holy Spirit will work in and through and around you wherever you are. That I believe. That I believe. But understand something. You are taught by the culture that you live in that Christianity is restrictive, boring, and small. That's what you're taught, right? Um, I'm 52 years old and I've loved pop culture since I was a child. I'm from that, gen so I'm Gen X, so I'm that generation that came up below the baby boomers and all they had was televisions. And so all we had was televisions. So for the first 15, 20 years of my life, all we had was TV. So you had to find books, find comics, find other things, you know, cassette tapes. I'm that generation. I graduated high school before I had a CD. So the, all that information, we had to work harder to get it. You guys have it all at your fingertips, every single ounce of it. And the culture that you live in, you are told that Christianity is small and old and dusty and not able to contain your life. But I'm telling you in 2024, I'm telling you in 2024, I just want you to hear this. It's the most vibrant, alive, and large, and encompassing worldview on the planet. And so everything else that you're going to attempt over the next 10 years, I know what it's like to be young. I know that's hard to see. But over the next 10 years, as all of you guys are out there scrounging and digging and clawing and trying to figure out, maybe it's this way, maybe it's this way, maybe it's this way. You remember this moment, May whatever, May 19th, 2024. You remember that I told you Christianity is more fragrant, more profound, more glorious, more beautiful, more valuable larger than any other worldview. And just remember this, in naturalism, you don't matter, history doesn't matter, you live, you die, and no one cares. In transcendentalism, you may be the most important person, Caleb, but you came from nothing and you will return to nothing, and it may take you 10,000 lifetimes to figure that out that you really don't matter. But in Christianity, I want you to hear this. I know so many of you think, so many of you just, in your bones, you just feel like it's just laws and do nots. Listen, in the letters of Paul, Paul taught me every promise of God is a yes in Christ Jesus. John taught me that God loves me from beginning to end, even as I do not deserve his love. Peter taught me that it's okay to be a fisherman. It's okay to want to fight sometimes. But it's most okay to, for a grown man to bend the knee to his king. These are all the lessons that I've learned from church history.
history. As I look back and reflect on those who came before me, as I live my life looking behind me and seeing the the dots line up, and as I look forward and see my future, history has a point in Christianity because it's all wrapped up in God's story. My story, your story, part of His story. History is God's story. Why do Christians believe that history is important? We really do believe that history is God's story. We really do believe that all of human history is just this much. It's just whatever it is, but it's, it's, this is part of God's story. Now he's, He transcends it. He transcends time, space, knowledge, matter, all of it. But He chose to engage with us and create for us a beginning, a middle, and an end. Here's what's crazy. In your, in your bones, you know that a traditional Judeo-Christian story makes sense. You know that it does. Every time you tell your story, you are living out Christian truth. Every time you watch a movie that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, you're valuing traditional Judeo-Christian values. We really do believe that man has a beginning, man has a middle, man has an end. Each human life has value, purpose, and meaning. Each man will be held accountable for his life. Your choices matter. The things that you say and the things that you do, they matter. And you will make mistakes. You will fall. You will mess your life up up. No one tells seniors this at senior graduation. I got so bored yesterday at that senior graduation, that precious young woman, God bless her, God bless the salutatorian and the valedictorian, but they got a lot of living to do. Both of these girls up there, CK is already nodding. Both of these girls up there, one of them, CK, literally, God bless her. One of them literally said, the fact that you've made it means you have a 100% success rate. Did you hear her say that, CK? A 100% success rate. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. And I'm thinking, child, you rode on the backs of giants to even get to this point. Are you even aware? And child, you made so many mistakes to get to this stage. Are you even aware? And child, precious little one, you're going to blow it in major ways over the next 20 years of your life. Are you still going to have the courage to say at 40, you are at a 100% success rate as you look around. My sweet, precious little valedictorian of Madison High School 2024. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're going to crash. You're going to burn. You're going to have scars. You're going to have loss. You're going to have suffering. Listen. Listen. This is what I would say to this child. This is what I'm saying to you. Listen. Your life still has value. Maybe because of all that, your life has value. Do you understand what I'm saying? God doesn't value... Listen, God doesn't value you because you're awesome. God values you because you're His. And frankly, you're not that awesome. You're really not. He values you anyway. I'm telling you, at 52, I'll be 52 next month. I'm already telling people I'm 52. At 52, I'm here to tell you I'm 51 and 11 twelfths. I'm here to tell you, I delight in the fact that God loves me even as He knows me. Do you hear me? My King knows my name. My King knows my name. He knows every mistake, every failure. He knows my story. He knows every event of my story, every success, every failure, every mistake, every flaw. Still loves me. That just makes me love him more. He says, come forward and bring your spear. And I limp as I walk toward him. And he smiles, knowing he doesn't really need my spear. Amen? He doesn't really need my spear, but I get to come along. 
He says, come with me. And I take my little shield and I take my little spear and I limp because I'm old and broke. Scarred from so many self-inflicted wounds. But he invites me. He invites me to join him. Christianity is not too small, young ones. Hear me. Christianity is not too small. That sweet, precious valedictorian, she's going to find out her worldview is extraordinarily small. It's extraordinarily small. Because she's human, which is to say she will fail at some point, somehow, some way. She will sin, she will fail, she will fall, she will stumble. And she'll look up and she'll have no longer a 100% success rate. And she won't know what to do. But a Christ follower, they stumble. They fall. Frail, fragile, sinful. But their king is right in front of them. He's right there. All they have to do is stand up. That's all. He, he waited. He paused in his journey. He, he is standing there. And all a Christian has to do is stand up. He can't get it all off. Amen? He can't. You've torn your sleeve and your hands are marred and your knees hurt now. And you've somehow lost your spear. <laughs> but he's right there. He's just right there. And so you laugh and he laughs. And he knows you didn't even need that spear. And he says, you ready? And you go, yes, Lord. And he starts to walk again. And you just follow him. That's it. It's... It's really not complicated, but it's exceedingly beautiful. It's exceedingly beautiful. What's the Christian view of history? The Christian view of history is there is a God who created history. All of human history. There's a God who created you. Shakespeare said it famously. Every man takes the stage. Every person takes the stage. Every person plays their part, then they exit the stage. If I'm, listen, if I'm talking to you right now, guess what? I got good news for you. You're on the stage. Right now. I don't know about all the people on the screen. I guess if they're hearing it, they too are on the stage at this point. If this is listened to 200 years from now, I'm no longer on the stage. Right now you are on the stage. Play your part, for you will exit the stage. That's glorious. The Christian view of history is glorious. He is here, and you are here, and your life matters. So play your part. So what's the greatest event in human history? For a Christian worldview, what's the greatest event in human history? We said it already. Amen. Here's how I wrote it. The life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ the Lord. The life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ the Lord. It's the greatest event in human history, Christians say this, we believe it. I hold it dear to my heart. When I read the end of the Bible, my favorite part, and I just, I'll read it now. Revelation 22. <clears throat> Revelation 22, verse 20 and 21. John speaks, uh, excuse me, Jesus speaks when he says... He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Jesus the Lord 
says, yes, I am coming soon. John replies, amen, come Lord Jesus. And then I'm not sure who's speaking in verse 21. I believe it's God. Could be John. It's often me. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. That's the beginning of the rest of your life, just so you know. So for, remember, for a naturalist, there is no point, no life, no meaning you live, you you were nothing, you live, you die. For the transcendentalist, you were nothing, you live, you die. For the Christian, you were nothing, you live, you die, then amen, Jesus. If you read the last chapter of Revelation, it's the beginning of the next phase of your life as a Christian. The last two chapters of the Bible are the next chapters of your next life. We shall see His face. He will be our God. We will be His people. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. What is life for a Christian? Life is everything. Life is a gift. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. More fully. I've said this to you before. The, the, I'm going to stop doing it. I'm, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm working on it. I'm going to stop asking young people, what are you going to do with your life? Or what, do you, what would you like to be in your life? I'm going to stop asking that question. I'm still not fully arrived, but I'm working on me. I'm going to start asking young people, what is God telling you to do with your life? If you've claimed to me to be a Christ follower, I'm going to ask you that question. If at some point you come up and take the communion, then you've confessed that Jesus is Lord. If you've been baptized, if you take communion, I'm just going to assume you're a Christ follower. And if you're young, I'm going to start asking you, what is God telling you that He wants you to do with your life? Because here's the thing, I don't care. And your parents shouldn't care. Did you all hear that? God is the one who should care. And you are the one who should care. And you are the one who should follow. The one who cares. So whether you are digging ditches or making pizzas or washing clothes, or you're an artist or you're an engineer, I don't care. I don't care. What I care is are you doing it for Him? Are you doing it with joy in your heart? Are you doing it with a smile on your face? Are you doing it to bring Him glory? Are you doing it because you love Him? Do it! We need more of that. Amen? The world was changed once by housewives and fishermen. Housewives and fishermen changed the world. Why? Because they were housewives and fishermen? No. Because they followed Christ. They just happen to be housewives and fishermen. <clears throat> Y'all help me work on that. Ian, every time I ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Just stop me. And Pastor Nate, that's not what we agreed on. Seven, seven facts about Jesus Christ's life. I'm going to do this kind of quickly because these are all things that we, I, I just believe these things fully. I'm devoted to them. These are easy things for a Christian. Number one, here's, here's seven facts about Christ's life. Number one, there are more historical documents than any other historical documents of the ancient Greek and Palestinian world. And here, this is really quickly. Tacitus, who gives us the annals. There's three. Plato, who gives us Crito and Phaedo. There's six. Julius Caesar's G Gallic War. There's ten copies. And Herodotus's histories. There's 15 copies. Homer's Iliad. We only have 190 copies. 190 sounds pretty good till you realize there's over 15,000 copies of the New Testament alone. So Homer's Iliad, of which today, if you read the Iliad, you'll see in the footnotes, this scholar says, blah, blah, blah. This scholar says, but there's 190 copies of it. We're doing the best we can with the Iliad. Raise your hand if you've read parts of it. Yeah, most of you. Still being read to this day. 
Homer's Iliad, 190 copies. How many copies of the New Testament? 15,000, give or take. Was Jesus' life a historical fact, yes or no? Yes. And I'm, I'm kind of pleased at this. Atheism's in a weird state in America right now, which I celebrate. Atheism's in a really weird place. A lot of the atheists who were leading the charge, even just 10 years ago, are dead. Praise be to God. Secondly, those that are still living, they're wavering big time. One of them went from Islam to atheism. Now she's a Christian. One of them, there's, there's quite a few of these that are, yeah, I'm, I could go on and on. Atheism's in a weird place in America. And I just say amen to that. I just say amen to that. I don't know where I was going with that. Oh, I remember. Thank you. There was a time when atheists would even say they weren't sure if Jesus was a historical figure. They were doing that from about the 70s through about 10 years ago. So a good, strong 50 years plus, they would literally, with a straight face, go into places like Cambridge and go, you know, we're not even sure if Jesus was a historical figure. There's quite a lot of uh, evidence that he never even existed. They would literally say that with a straight face. Now, now you get an atheist in a room, they're like, oh yeah, he was, Jesus was a real person. Well, what about, no, 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 that's just silly. Jesus was a real person. That's nice. I don't need it, but it's nice. I don't need an atheist to tell me Jesus was a historical figure, but I'll take it. Number two, the historical documents were of eyewitness testimonies, eyewitness testimonies, eyewitness testimonies. This is another one that they're seeding ground on for the longest time. They would get in the details and tweak them and go, not really, not really, not really. No, really, eyewitnesses. These people all knew Christ. They all witnessed Christ. They all saw Christ, interacted with Christ. They uh, take the four Gospels very quickly. <clears throat> Matthew, tax collector, one of the twelve. How many of the Gospels are written by disciples? Quick, quick, quick. Four Gospels. How many written by the disciples? Quick, quick, quick. How many? Not all of them. Not three. You've only got two more guesses. Two. Two of the four were written by disciples. What does that mean? That means two of the four Gospels were written by guys that were with Jesus morning, noon, night, day, weekends, no time off, sold everything, ate with Him, slept with Him for three plus years. Two of the four Gospels. Is that eyewitness enough for you? Me too. What about the other two? One was written by Luke, little brother of Paul. Paul also was an eyewitness of Christ. How do we know this? Say it, Sam. Blinded by Christ on the road to Emmaus. Was it Emmaus or Damascus? Damascus. Thank you, Damascus. Who, who was on the road to Emmaus? The resurrected Christ. Two witnesses. All right. Two more witnesses on the road to Emmaus. Look what we did. We did it. We got two more witnesses. Luke was there the whole time. When Paul was experiencing Christ, Luke was there. Luke was in the middle of all of this. Luke was friends with Barnabas, Silas, John, Mark, Peter, Paul, Luke, John. Luke was the doctor. Luke was the, the thoughtful, rhetorical, logical, reasonable. In fact, he says... I think it's Theophilus. Does he write his book to Theophilus? Man, my memory's terrible this morning. Luke literally says, I thought it was worthy to, to write down a, what does he say, a considered, a thoughtful, a reasonable, reasonable, a reasonable account, Luke says. I thought it worthwhile to set down a reasonable account. Does that sound like a kook to you? Does that sound like a nut job to you? Luke wrote Acts and Luke, considered to be one volume if you want to think of it that way. Who's the fourth gospel? Mark. Mark was not an eyewitness. He was not a disciple, I should say. But he was there all the time. Mark is sometimes called Peter's gospel. Why would the gospel of Mark sometimes be called Peter's gospel? Because Mark was Peter's spiritual little brother. Everywhere that Peter went, Mark was sure to follow. 
Mark was also Paul's little brother. Went on the first missionary journey. Left. Left him in a bind. Yeah, same Mark. Amen. Barnabas wanted to take him back on the second missionary journey, sister. And Paul said, no. Paul could be rigid. So Barnabas said, he going. So Barnabas took Mark and they went east. And I'm, I don't know where they went. And Silas and, sorry, yeah, Peter, Paul. Man, this is hard. Paul and Silas went one way. Barnabas and Mark went another way. What's cool about that? Four missionaries, two different directions. Amen? Conflict in the church. Eyewitnesses. We get two books in the Bible, James and Jude. You know who they were? Half-brothers of Christ. How many books written by John? Let's see. Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, book of Revelation, 5. How many books from Peter? Technically Mark, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 3 Peter. How many books in the New Testament written by eyewitnesses of Jesus? All of them. All of them. All the books of the New Testament were written by eyewitnesses to Christ. All of them. Number three. The reliability of the Gospels includes material from A, eyewitnesses, B, in a faith community that could correct and reprove. Understand that the New Testament is formed over about a 30-year period. In that entire time, there's a lot of people in those churches who could go time out. That's not how that happened. These, God, these books come to us through great scrutiny. They don't bear the scrutiny of being a hoax. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. If you were creating a hoax of Christianity, the life of Christ, why would you put in there that Peter denied Jesus three times? Why would you put that in there? If you were trying to create a religious text as a hoax to manipulate the world, why would you put that in there? Why would you put it in there that John, remember John writes five books in the New Testament. Five books in the New Testament. One of the pillars of the church. Why would you put it in your own, why would you put it in the Gospels that John, you, why would you put that in there that he wanted to rain down fire on an entire village because he thought that they were too much sinners? Why would you put that in there? Why would you put in it that Matthew was a tax collector? You could hide that. You can just say, Matthew, just a really good guy. Matthew, solid. Matthew, kind to his mother. He was considered a sinner, a great sinner, by all the people in his culture. Why would you put in that, that um, what, even the, the story of Lazarus, why would you put in there that the sister, uh, Mary, fussed at Jesus for not being there sooner? Why would you put that in there? Why not just have Jesus arrive exactly when he wants to and everybody's fine with it? Oh, amen, Jesus is here. Get to healing. No, Mary fusses at him, meets him on the road, stops him before he can get to the tomb, fusses at him. Why would you do that? When you read the Gospels, when you read the letters of, of Paul, when you read the, the book of Acts, th I just told you that the second missionary journey exists because of conflict. Because Paul said no and Barnabas said yes to John Mark? There's too much realness in the New Testament. There's too much realness. It reads like it really happened. It reads like it would be if, as if it happened to you. Trust me, if I was writing the book of, of uh, CCCGJ, I would put everything in it. I would put all the sin I would tell all the secrets. I would. And you guys would run me out of town. That's how the, that's how the New Testament reads. It reads as if it really happened because it did. Um, number four. How many eyewitnesses were recorded as seeing Jesus after his resurrection? Over 500. 
Over 500. I was trying to get you to be louder, Caleb. You were right on the number. Over 500 eyewitnesses just in one place. Right? By the way, these people would have been accountable to the, to the Romans, and they were accountable to the Romans as citizens. These were not easy things to lie about. Number six, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up. <clears throat> the resurrection is more attested than any of the theories that he did not rise. The resurrection of Christ has more validity than the fact that he did not rise from the dead. Let me say that a third time. The fact that he did rise from the dead has more authority than if he did not rise from the dead. Meaning, it is more rational and reasonable to assume that he did rise from the dead rather than he did not rise from the dead. Number one, here's the theories that he did not rise. A, fraud theory. Fraud theory. These are old theories about... Jesus not rising from the dead. Old theories. Fraud theory. The disciples stole the body, then lied about the resurrection. There are honest-to-goodness scholars, not so much now, but for hundreds of years, who would say Jesus never rose from the grave. It was all a fraud perpetrated by the disciples. Why does that theory fall apart? Why does the fraud theory fall apart? Why is it not likely at all? What happened to the disciples within days of the resurrection in terms of James, brother of John, and within years for all of them? What happened? Martyred, killed, dead, murdered. And not just the disciples, how many Christians? How many? How many? A lot. Hundreds, if not eventually thousands, just in the region. At what point would the church have stopped being the church? If it were a fraud, let me, let me just say it more clearly. If I'm following a fraud and I know it's a fraud, and you come to me and say, hey Nate, stop telling people about the fraud or we kill you, I'm going to consider highly to just leave town. I'm just going to not keep saying the fraud. Why? Because I'm not willing to die for a fraud. That's why there's cheaper, easier work out there, lads. You can always wash dishes. You can always wash dishes. Do you hear me? I'm not down for a fraud. You? I didn't think so. You telling me these fishermen couldn't have gone back to commercial fishing? I assure you they could have. And by the way, Galilee's a long way from Jerusalem. It would have been easy. You telling me Peter, James, and John, Simon, uh, Andrew, I meant to say, you telling me they couldn't have found work again in Galilee? Yes, they could have. Fraud theory is a weak, weak, weak theory. Swoon theory. Swoon, S-W-O-O-N. Old theory. Been around a long time. Swoon theory. Swoon theory says Jesus didn't actually die. He literally fainted. He swooned. He fainted. And then he was revived by the disciples later. Man, there's so many holes in this theory. Can somebody give me just some obvious holes in this theory? He was crucified. Note the details of his death, right? Note the details. You didn't survive a crucifixion, a Roman crucifixion. Number one, you didn't survive a Roman beating. It is a miracle of God that Jesus made it to the cross. Can we say that? It is a miracle of God that Jesus made it to the cross. That's mind-blowing for me to even say. It feels wrong even. God, thank you for the miracle of allowing Jesus to get to the cross. The, the loss of blood, the loss of consciousness, the loss of muscle, the loss of energy. The, uh, just, it's a miracle he got there. Um, you do know he died quickly, right? You know that. He died quickly. Six hours. Average time is much longer. The average person wasn't beaten like Jesus. The other two thieves on either side of him, did they die that same day? Yes, no. Yes. Remember the Roman guards broke their legs to ensure it? Didn't have to break Jesus' legs. Why? 
He's already dead. What happened when they poked him in the side? Blood and water. Plural effusion. His lungs had given out. Full of water. And the soldiers pierced his lungs. Fresh water. Note the symbolism. Swoon theory is really dumb. Not the least of which is, who would have determined the death? The Roman soldiers who would have had to have answered for the body. So you're telling me that the Roman soldiers let the disciples take him off the cross? Let them take the body? Let them leave with the body? That's what you're telling me. You know what the historical account tells us? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had to go get permission from Pilate to even take the body. That's the historical fact. That's how that would have worked. Otherwise, the body's not yours. Swoon theory is really dumb. Hallucination theory. This one's dumb. Hallucination theory. There are people who believe that everybody in the area just hallucinated the entire resurrection. Let me tell you something about hallucinations. <clears throat> we know a lot... Uh, let, let me start that sentence over. I'm not even sure that that's true. We understand and have terminology for psychology now. Very modern usage of psychology. Very modern sense of psychology, which is to say the human mind. Conscious, unconscious. Hallucinations do not take place like this. Either the event happened or it didn't. But no group of people larger than, say, one hallucinates the same event. If you had 500 eyewitnesses, they would not all hallucinate the same thing. That's not how hallucinations work. It's a, it's a bizarre theory. Last one, the wrong tomb theory. The wrong tomb theory. The wrong tomb theory says that Jesus did die. He was buried in a tomb. But that on the third day, the housewives, the fishermen, they all went to the wrong tomb. And so there was no body because they were at the wrong tomb. Right? Why is this one dumb? Why is this theory just dumb? Dumb, 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 dumb. Why is it dumb? I can think of a couple reasons real quick. They would have known the exact tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, correct? Good, Sam. Let's say a few more things like that. Very obvious things. Well, real quick, uh, one second, Will. Oh, sure. So we still wouldn't have said wrong thing. How is it easy to fix, sister? Then they will check the right tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What were you going to say, Wilson? So along the with Sam's argument, since Joseph was very rich, he probably would have bought several acres of his own land. Uh, we don't know about all that. I mean, it was, it was a city, city style in Jerusalem. But, uh, okay, let's say a few more obvious things. Where are the guards? You understand the Roman guards aren't at the wrong tomb. If you go to the wrong tomb and it's open and empty, where are the guards? The Roman guards were at the right tomb. Because this was a convicted criminal who everybody got up in arms about, yada, yada, yada. So just look for the tomb with the Romans. Let's start there. Also, let's go to Joseph's tomb. <laughs> It's probably Joseph's tomb with Roman guards. Also, the housewives and the fishermen have already been there to see where he was laid. In fact, the women, it says, one of the Gospels, they went there to prepare him for burial, but it was already too late, so they waited until Sunday. They knew where it was. They'd already been by it. So, why go over these? This is an example of the historical arguments that have gone back and forth on Christ. Do you understand that for every book on a bookshelf, do you understand for every book on a bookshelf of a library that talks about the life of Christ in an orthodox way, a Christian way, a biblical way, do you understand for every book that does that, there's a hundred books that don't? Do you understand that? That I could take you in libraries and show you 
I've owned many of them in my time. I'm at, an, I'm at an age in my ministry where I've really, I've let go of a lot of things. I used to have way too many books. I had an entire section of books, an entire section by men who taught in U.S. seminaries who did not believe in Jesus. Now, why would Nate Carroll own a bunch of books by seminary professors with multiple doctorates behind their names. And I'm talking the Ivy Leagues. I'm talking they were at Duke, Princeton, Harvard, the big boys. Why would I own these books of these men who were scholars and did not follow Christ? Why would I do that? Why would I do that? Can you imagine? That's right. Possibly, sister, one day to tell you that I once owned those books and read those books. Possibly to say to you that those men exist. That those men... Had, they always bring these guys out at Easter. That's what you need to know. If you're flipping... There's no longer a history channel. But there, or is there a history channel? Fifteen years ago, this was... 25 to, to 10 years ago, this was a big deal. Every Easter, you'd be flipping through. You should note this. Every Easter, there's always going to be a blasphemous movie that Hollywood puts out. Write this down on your, on your mind. Every Easter, Hollywood puts out a blasphemous movie. And there's always a documentary about Easter from a liberal perspective, meaning a non-Christian perspective, meaning people who don't actually believe Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus was resurrected and ascended. Every Easter. Pay attention. You'll see it now. There's always a documentary talking about how Jesus really wasn't God, but He was just a good man. Just to, We can all agree Jesus was a good man. And there's always a blasphemous movie. Go back and look. You can find them. Go back and look at Hollywood every year. Look at Spring. What's the value of history? To a naturalist, it's nothing. It's no, no matter. What is it to a transcendentalist? It's also nothing. It doesn't matter. Give up, give up desire, give up passion, become nothing, because that's where you're headed. What is it for a Christian? This is glorious to me. This is why I say Christianity is so much bigger than the world will allow it to be. Listen, listen. Jesus said, if a man would fall after me, he must give up his life, die to himself, and follow me. But Jesus also said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. I'm not asking you to be a preacher today. I'm asking you to be a computer engineer, a dishwasher, a housewife, a student. Whatever you were already planning to do, I'm just asking you, I'm telling you, the Christian worldview says, just follow Christ as you do it. Just follow Christ as you do it. You will be the best fill in the blank if you follow Christ. You, whatever that thing is, which I don't care about, let me remind you. Whatever that fill in the blank is, you will be the best at it if you are following Christ. That's it. And your life will have great value. And the history of you, people will look back and say, like Pastor She said this morning, at your funeral, people will look back at you and I pray and hope that they will say, She loved Jesus. He followed 